Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We are going to start off showing you a few of the new um, user functions, and then we're going to go right into some of the new indices that have been added. Um, most important, I think, and exciting to the users is some of the lane data that we've added. So um, with that, we'll start with the Knowledge Center update is now located under the question mark instead of under your name drop down and it is taking you to the same site as before the www.freightways.com front slash sonar where you can see all of our market insight updates that come out tuesday our webinars that of course come out on wednesdays and all of the ticker information the new data sets explanations of the data sets from what you are looking at to how often they are updated in the Sonar platform. And Zach is on, was showing all of the index information there. Um, so that is the Knowledge Center. And we are going to jump right into our explanation and our presentation of some of the lane data. So I'm gonna hand things over to our market analyst also known as the Sultan of Sonar, Zach Strickland. Thank you, Brad. Uh, so we did a pretty significant update this week to Sonar. We added two new big, uh, highly anticipated tickers, uh, the lane data on the tender rejection indexes and the uh, DAT uh, rate uh, situation for the seven lanes. Yes. So there's gonna, be, there's gonna be a few more additions there. Uh, but we'll get into that here in a little bit. So we did make a lot of adjustments to the to the user experience. Uh, we made some things a little bit easier to, to navigate. Um, down here in the bottom, you can now uh, choose your date range. So if you want to go in and see just for the month of July, uh, you just pick a beginning and an end date like that. <clears throat> and now you'd have that clean window and you can actually like it, it sticks until you tell it not to stick anymore. So you can go in here and check out what's going on in Albany. It's gonna keep your window in the same space. I know it help, it's helpful for me. Um, and keeping consistency across uh, data analyst, analysis, sorry. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about the lanes and I'm gonna dive into those a little bit more detail later as it pertains to markets. Um, right now, what we've done, is we've added outbound tender rejection index for lane data. Now they're not necessarily outbound tender rejection indexes because they're lanes, but that's the ticker that we use is the OTRI. Um, that's just what everybody else has been using. We feel like it's the most, uh, it'll be the easiest to kind of grasp as we uh, type in the symbols. So if I wanna go into any market and you're gonna see this list, and obviously we know that I don't, I don't even, know how to, uh, I haven't memorized the entire uh, market in terms of airport codes or, or lane codes, but that's where I would reference this index guide up here that I pulled up when we uh, first started going to the Knowledge Center. That's going to show you all of the uh, lanes that are available, uh, or the markets I should say that are available uh, when you're combining into uh, certain lanes. So you'd pick out, if you wanted to know Buffalo to Montgomery Lane, you'd type in otri.buffalo, B-U-F, M-G-M, and that would give you the lane data there. Uh, so you'll see also a starting list, and it's listed in alphabetical order now. That should help a little bit, but obviously there's a lot of lanes available. And a point of note is that not all lanes are gonna be available when you type them in. For instance, if I were to type in that Buffalo to Montgomery Lane, it probably doesn't exist and that's because there's not enough uh, load volume going in that lane. So if you see it listed on the, uh, when you type in otri.buff, those are literally all the lanes that are available out of Buffalo, New York. So let's go into one. Uh, let's pick out, let's pick out a big one like Atlanta. So we have otri Atlanta and now one of the values of this is now you can go out and compare uh, Atlanta lanes. So pick out some of the more popular lanes out of Atlanta. Let's see here, you got Nashville, and then you got, I'll try that. Um, it's another big lane, 
Orlando or Lakeland as uh, the KMA is def defined. So you can now break out what the OTRI or the tender rejection index is doing in that market. And you can get a clearer view, uh, more granular view of what's impacting that, that number. So you can actually break apart the Atlanta lane and see specifically what lanes are impacting and moving that, that number in, in, you know, OTRI Atlanta. Well, that, that's the entire country. Now you can go out and see, wait a minute, uh, Nashville's having a big, uh, big week. That's really what's driving that number. Uh, as you can see here, there's pretty decent correlation between these three markets or these two lanes, I should say. Uh, they move similarly. Uh, I would note that any time that one of these lanes moves contrary to the uh, main index, kind of like with the uh, the main market, the OTRI USA, it, when you're comparing uh, different outbound markets and the national index, it's kind of like the benchmark. Uh, so you, you're looking for anomalies where they're moving in opposite directions. Um, I'm going to show you one of those here in a little while. Uh, but right now you see that both of these lanes are kind of moving at the same in the same pattern to the Atlanta market, which again is kind of cooling down at the moment. Uh, the next big uh, release uh, ticker is the DAT uh, lanes. So as you can see here, here's a list of the lanes that are available. I, I want to first point out that this does not replace rate view. Uh, they're not they're not the same uh, values as rate view. These are these are made for different purposes, uh, but they are kind of uh, good lanes in terms of judging what the overall market and the country's doing. So, uh, I believe 22% of the freight movements in the country flow through these lanes specifically, and they have a direct impact on 80% of the capacity in North and in, in America. So. That's why these were chosen. They were, they were chosen to be these lanes that basically kind of benchmarked uh, the United States. Some of them have seasonal movements in them. Some of them are more uh, national. Uh, they correlate with the national freight picture, uh, but there's a good amount of freight represented in these, in these seven lanes. So we'll go ahead and pick one right here. Uh, DAT uh, Van Daly final report. Uh, what that means is uh, this is the last uh, this is the last reported uh, uh, rate. So there's, there's actually, I should break this down a little bit further. So what DAT is doing here, and they're going to represent this number as well and through their, their stuff eventually at some point. But basically what they're doing is making sure that this number is, is you know, had outliers pulled out of it. Uh, there, there's no hazmat. Um, some accessorials are pulled out to make sure that this number is the truest representation of what's happening in that lane at that time. Now there is a four to eight day lag in that number, uh, just because it takes a while to get the, uh, the information process cleaned up. And we need to make sure that uh, there's no changes to the, to the information because it need, that's why we call it final, um, making sure that that number is as true as possible representation to what that number is. And right now you see that the outbound or the Atlanta to Philly lane is operating at about $2.36 a, uh, a mile. And you see right here, that's as of 724. And that's due to the four to eight day lag. So weekends are not included in this. Uh, so you won't see any weekend representation here. So 721 and 722 are not in here, if you'll notice that. Um, is there anything that we need to add to that? Do you think, Brad? Yeah, I think that's I think that's good, and I think you can show how you can look at the tender rejection index, and more specifically, probably the the lane data now um, on that specifically. And I think it's a good time to show. Um, oh, I've got to put it into a uh, yeah into two separate charts yeah. for for ease of of use or uh, reviewing. And then we can show as well one of the new functions in the chart. Oh yeah, um, I should comparison. have talked about that as well. Yeah, so, we'll show that. so now we've actually added this new uh, decision. I think a lot of the early adopters know about this, uh, but now we've added a choice. Like we changed it over to the absolute comparison style to where basically that means you have uh, the same uh, Y axis. So now, you're going to have the uh, so when that's useful when comparing like similar uh, denominators. So anytime that you're comparing two different values or two different indices with the same uh, y-axis value, such as dollar rate per mile, uh, 
percentage, uh, TRI, it's very useful in comparing similar numbers. When you change that into like what we're doing right here, going to compare a percentage to a uh, rate per mile, those two numbers do not, they, they're not comparable. So you have to change it into something that makes them easily fit on the same uh, graph. Uh, it helps with the scaling. So I'll just go ahead and show you. So I'm gonna change it over to relative because the uh, rate per mile and percentage that happens on the TRI does not necessarily line up. So I'm gonna say, go try DTL PHL. And now it'll give me a relative access. So you can see here, now you're looking at the percent change from this start point again. I think a lot of people that were using Sonar in the early days, this is all you could do. And now you can kind of see how they're moving together. Uh, sometimes they have a little bit of, of moving apart, but that's because you have you know two different data sets uh, that don't have the same kind of function and form. So you can see here, they generally move together uh, as, as they can. And you're seeing the outbound tender rejection index for the uh, Atlanta to Philly lane go at 2% change right now in terms of uh, daily change. And then down here, you'll see a negative 7% on the uh, Atlanta to Philly. Now you'll see here that you're missing some of this space and that's because uh, the OTRI is a daily number and you have a little bit of a lag in the DAT uh, final report number for the rate per mile just because of the fact that there is some scrubbing that has to be done on that number. So there you go. And then pull up, pull up another chart as well so we can show how to view um, alongside of each other in that new okay. function. So add another, let's just say maybe oh. del delete the... Here, yeah, I'll clear out one. Perfect. All right. Which one do you want to see, Brad? Um, same one? Yeah, it's still the same one. All right. So now you have the opportunity to kind of hide that tab. So if you're working off of a laptop or, you know, a smaller single screen and you don't want to jumble everything together on one screen, now you can a little easy, a little more easily um, look, at, look at a couple different charts. And as you can imagine, if you, you know, have, let's say you name a custom page, uh, Atlanta, you can, you know, kind of go through here and create these different charts. You can put your pricing in there. You can put your different lanes. You can of course compare across these different charts. Um, maybe you want to change modes and show van only as, as one of your tabs and reefer only. Um, so it just gives you a little, a little bit easier to view some of these charts um, as opposed to having them all on one screen. But of course that's still available if you, uh, if you prefer that as well. Yeah. And you can look at them, obviously a lot of, uh, there's going to be, it's going to be hard to look at this on a laptop at this point in this view, but you can move them all over the page, uh, arrange them how you want. Again, a lot of this is a, uh, kind of 101 stuff. We're not gonna spend too much time in the 101 space for those of you that are new or just getting introduced to uh, Sonar. Uh, we forgot to mention that at the beginning. This is not necessarily a, an advanced course or, or webinar. It's more uh, slightly advanced user uh, focused. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more and it's your first time, seriously, don't get, don't get intimidated. Go to the website and uh, we've got a lot of videos out there that kind of walk through some of these, uh, like we have our early webinars that actually have 101 webinars out there for the first month of the release. Uh, just go to the website and you'll see uh, some of those listed. And then you have the weekly update videos that are also kind of user case uh, oriented. Um, and obviously you can contact us with any questions that you have. I just want to make sure that uh, some of the newer people that may have not seen Sonar before that have tuned into this webinar, they know that this is not a uh, uh, kind of an introduction to Sonar. This is more of a 201 class like course. What are, what are we adding this week? Uh, what's new? And then how do we use some of this information? And then I'm going to go through a little bit of a market recap for the week. Or make that clear. Cause I know that there are people that are probably tuned in for the first time and they're like, what is a tender rejection index? <laughs> so exactly. what they would do is just go to the knowledge base and there's a button there 
that's going to show you all about the tender rejection index. There's even a video that gives you a quick use case um, on how to use it. So I think we've covered the first, uh, the, the two new uh, tickers this week. Uh, I think that would be a good time to kind of recap the market. Yeah, let's jump into Let's that. jump right into it. So I'm going to use some of these new uh, indexes to kind of illustrate what we're dealing with in the freight market nowadays. So I pulled up the DAT van daily uh, rate per mile to Los Angeles to Dallas. So what this is going to show you, and I'm going to pull up a five year because you do have, you do have, we do have about five years of data on this, on this number. Again, DAT is going to put this on their stuff as well. And in no way am I advocating you drop rate view for, uh, for the sonar. It does not replace it. I want to reiterate that there are only seven lanes in here. Uh, there are thousands of different OD pairs in the country that you could, you could get into uh, that DAT covers that we do not. So just want to make sure that we make that clear. Um, so one thing that we noticed, and one of our uh, writers, John Paul Hampstead, actually covered this uh, this week on FreightWaves.com, that there is actually uh, an impact, there's the July effect, which I believe we talked about in the past on the CAS index, uh, which is shipper volume. And I'll pull that one up here in a minute when I'm done with this. Uh, but there's this noted uh, muting of uh, freight flows in the month of July. A lot of, there's a lot of stuff that's in there that, you know, it's just a natural time of year for freight to kind of slow down. Shippers kind of slow down because it's one of the most heavily vacation months of the year next to Christmas. Um, and what that means is a lot of uh, the shippers are actually pushing volume just to make sure that one, they're finishing up the quarter strong and two, they're making sure that before everybody takes their vacation for July 4th, uh, the inventory is available for all of their employees to purchase off the shelves when they're on vacation. <laughs> So nobody wants to have an emergency shipment. As we all know, freight costs can be quite high as drivers also like to take vacations at the same time as well as carriers. So with a lot of the country taking a vacation, uh, that just means that the economy kind of slows down in a natural pace. Just like June is the natural time of year in the middle of the summer, May, June, for uh, freight flows to really pick up and start hammering out. Uh, July kind of has that cooling effect and you can see that illustrated in the uh, Los Angeles to Dallas lane because it's a pretty good indicator of the country in general. Um, so I'm going to hover over some places here and you're going to see every year in July, the rate somewhat falls. I mean, there's obviously little spikes here and there, but it hits like a little bottom in, in that first couple of weeks of August. And then all of a sudden, boom, it comes right back. So August uh, 17th, 24th, the uh, rates hit a bottom and then they start coming back up in 2014. I think a lot of people remember 2014 as a pretty big year as well as, so we're going to go to what was a slower, well, somewhat slower year. And here in Ju July of uh, 2015 or August, 2015, little bottom. And then it starts elevating again into the holiday season. I think you get the picture at this point, August 7th, 2016, uh, very slow year for freight, but you see the point that I'm making. August 2015, there you go. And then freight rates tend to increase in this lane that time of year. Now, LAX to Dallas is not the entire country. Uh, it has its own rhythm uh, of its own, but we think that it is a good representation of uh, what the freight market does in general this time of year. Uh, obviously, hurricane season has an impact. Uh, you see here in 2017 uh, was a special year for freight, uh, certainly for carriers and brokers. <laughs> Shippers may have not enjoyed 2017 near as much as uh, carriers and brokers did as we see that this giant rate increase happens in the spot market, which most of us know by now had a significant impact on the contract uh, in, implementations this year as they got a lot of rate increases. Um, again, August 13th, 6th, uh, freight market turns around, hurricanes hit in September, uh, then a mass uh, UPS, Amazon holiday season freight rates elevate. So I thought that was a good uh, kind of representation of what happened in 2017 and then in years prior, like August, most people that make rates 
uh, as I did in the past, know that August tends to have uh, a moment of turbulence. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to, it's going to last throughout the rest of the year, but uh, July cools, August turns up. So coming up, we see this year had one of those, we've had declining uh, activity all July. Um, yeah, and I think we've seen that across the board, as you mentioned, with the CAS freight index. And um, I think the interesting thing is I know as uh, users of Sonar that have access can see the um, how much data, we, back data we have on the tender reject index is only going back to roughly October. But it's interesting to look at those alongside, for example, if you wanted to show an OD pair, or in this case, if you want to show just the overall OTRI in the U.S. compared to CAS freight index, it's really interesting to see the the movement of the tender reject index in comparison with shipment volume. And again, the you know the helpful thing about the outbound tender reject index is mapping the point of transaction or the electronic tender, so we're able to to show you what's happening. Um, a little bit quicker than some of the, the freight invoicing tools, for example, like a CAS freight index, um, which we're showing on the left, um, which gives you an idea of shipments, but typically that's around a month at least. Yeah, the, 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 CAS, the CAS index is released monthly. Um, outbound tender rejection indexes or rates are a daily number. Uh, you'll get yesterday's tender rejection index number today. Uh, so that's a, that's pretty near time. It also makes it a little bit more volatile uh, than than some of these monthly indicators are. They've got some smoothing in them that you're not going to see uh, with the tender rejection index. But that's because we have daily values. Any kind of daily number or or you're getting a value on a daily basis tends to have a little bit more uh, jaggedness in a chart. Um, whereas you're going to have these sharp, broad movements in a monthly indicator. So. I think one of the cool things about the CAS index, the shipment volume, obviously shipment volume is not the only indicator of freight capacity uh, problems. Uh, volume is just one aspect of it. Another is uh, carrier attitude, behavior. Uh, I, we've talked about in the past uh, just what carriers can do when they feel that they are undervalued on the contract side. Uh, they start turning loads down more frequently. And you see that here. It doesn't necessarily show up as much in the volume, although relationally there was a lot more volume in uh, January this year than there was in the previous January. Right over here, uh, 2000, there we go. So this traditional drop in shipping volume in January, which I think everybody that's been in the freight market knows, you can you, you don't even have to look at the, uh, the x-axis here to know what, what month that is. It just dies. Freight dies. Carriers uh, don't have to do as much. This year, the volume was as high in January as it was in July of 2017, which is a pretty significant uh, number. Carriers were probably taken off guard, but it wasn't just that. It was the idea that carriers were operating off of these 2016 uh, rates, which you can see 2016, not a very active year relative to the previous years. It, it didn't get as high as any of the previous four years. And then 2017 was as high as 2014 uh, was, which 2014 was a pretty big year for freight. And then now we're in 2018, shipping volumes went off the chart, and now we see that they've kind of come down a little bit. So, and just like clockwork, the tender rejection index shows that the United States had a lot more, uh, Heated activity uh, as capacity was not as available in June. And right here you see a lot of what I, I believe is carriers playing the spot market because their contracts simply had not been implemented yet. Uh, so they were turning down loads that were operating off year old rates and then going into the spot market. So you see this elevation, contract implementation, and we're, it cools off for a month yeah. before things turn back up again. So from that, I kind of want to uh, talk about the ports this week a little bit because we've got a lot of trade um, talk going on. That seems to be the theme of the month. Uh, I'm pulling up the Freytos Baltic Index, uh, which is, and I'm glad I've got some call-outs already done here, uh, 
So what this is, is a measure of the spot market price for a 40 foot container rate uh, from China to North American West, uh, which is a kind of marine way of annotating this. Mm -hmm. So you see right here this year, we've had uh, here in, in throughout the winter, we had elevated volumes, which is indicated by the higher spot market price. And then they drop off because uh, every year in China, they basically shut down for four to six weeks, or actually they shut down for two weeks. Then it takes them another couple of weeks to get back in, employed and back into the market. They start ramping up production. Uh, and that takes a little bit of time to fill, build up the inventory, start packing the containers again. And then every May, what do you know? They're back in line and freight, uh, the container rates start spiking again. And that's exactly what happens uh, this year. And then this year happens. And I, I kind of want to make a parallel because I think this is going to be important in the future for uh, as we move into the fall. What's going to happen uh, this fall when the tariffs and everybody have started kind of pulling back volumes or maybe they're, you know, they're no longer available because they know that uh, the tariffs are going to keep them from shipping freight over to America. But also what's happened is a lot of capacity is coming out of the container market in the Trans-Pacific uh, lanes. I think about 20% of the capacity is scheduled to come offline in the Pacific or Trans-Pacific uh, in the next month. So that's probably going to have a pretty big impact to uh, freight flows in, in the country. So the, the Freightos Baltic is going to be one to watch here over the next six months, I think, because this is this right here. This isn't just a function like, just like in the freight markets, this isn't a function of volume, but also of carrier sentiment. Uh, so with them reducing capacity, uh, for anybody that's been on a supply demand curve, they know uh, you constrict supply and that's going to push you closer to equilibrium in terms of demand, but it's also gonna increase the rate. So the rate's gonna come up as su supply constricts and if demand stays the same. So right now we still have demand for all this stuff. I mean, we've been, think about it. We, I think all of our behaviors are still the same right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we still wanna go to the store and, and buy our electronics and all of our same things that we were buying. Retail actually looks pretty good right now. I'll pull up one of our economic indicators to kind of tie this together. So I've gone over these uh, indicators in the past. For those of you that are new, uh, there's a few webinars that kind of introduce all of our indicators, uh, maybe not in as granular of detail because that, that can be a little bit tiresome to dig through, but it does introduce you to what we're kind of going for. We, we obviously do not have the entire catalog of economic indicators and in, in sonar. We've picked out the ones that are the, we feel are the most viable to the transportation industry. Uh, also the ones that kind of they may not tell you the entire story of, of what's happening in the overall economy, but they tell you enough of the story to kind of tie things together uh, in, in, in the market. Because as we all know, the economy drives freight flows. Uh, if GDP goes up, it generally meant that a bunch of goods moved through the, the freight system, the transportation networks. So supply chain, all that. And retail is a big driver of that. So. Here's retail sales, and these are these are a little bit lagging. Uh, they're going to be their monthly indicators, and the government does produce these. Uh, this is oh yeah, and as, yeah, as we move through some, you know, tender rejection index, DAT pricing, cash freight index, right now retail sales. As we move through these different tickers, this is a very helpful new tool that we've added, which is the symbol information, um, where you can see all of the information, how it's listed from a granularity standpoint, this one being USA, um, the frequency, the M standing for monthly, and the unit type, which is one thing to note as you know, if you're cross comparing um, some of these indices. Yeah, this is the retail sales year over year percentage change. Uh, it's good info to know. So basically what this is telling you is that in the month of May, uh, we had a 6.46% increase year over year uh, in, in that number. Because if you look at retail sales itself, you may not necessarily know what that is telling you. You can see that it moves up and to the right, which of course implies that all things are going well uh, in the economy. The up and to the right chart, I think everybody loves that one. It's the most 
It's the easiest to understand. Um, but it doesn't include things like inflation, uh, the cost of goods, I mean, things like that that are, that are going on that retail sales does not clean back out. So you need some sort of point of reference. Uh, retail sales itself, a uh, good way of thinking about this is what is current inflation? If it's around 2%, which I think it is currently, um, that's kind of a number that you would subtract from your growth number. So 6.46% in retail sales year over year change means that we've probably grown at an organic rate of about four point something percent. So that's, that's good news for the retail sector, which means that demand is still going strong, which means that your freight flows are still going to be moving through the network. Um, which is a, a good point of reference for a time like this, like July when things are much slower Yes. So, and that, and that's a good point, Brad. The, uh, <clears throat> the reason a lot of these economic indicators are, are in here is, is not necessarily to give you, uh, you know, some sort of foresight into the future, but it's, it allows you to give a point of reference uh, of, of what's going on in the overall economy because everything's interconnected. If people are buying up uh, goods, uh, then generally you're going to have a lot more to transport throughout the system. Um, so if I want to know what a seasonal flow of retail is, I'll go back to one of these economic indicators like retail sales and I'll see, or retail sales may not be the best one to show like a, the, how the economy is doing overall, but it's just going to give you another point of reference to know that, Hey, things are still going well. I can still kind of consider the economy going strong. Uh, even though freight flows have kind of slowed down a little bit, I need more information to uh, truly predict what's about to happen in the market. So on that note, I'm going to move back into the uh, lanes this week. So LA has been a lane that we talk about quite a bit, or the, the market that we've talked about quite a bit over the past bit. Uh, you can see here that LA has kind of cooled off a little bit and we had a little bit of a bump here in the middle of July. We think a lot of that had to do with some of the container freight coming in on the, from China as people were trying to get in front of the tariffs. Uh, you have some, we think where there's a little bit of port clog going on. Uh, rail, uh, I think is at capacity at this point. Um, so the Los Angeles market is really kind of, I wouldn't call it a bellwether, but it is a market that has tremendous impact to the freight networks of the country. So it's one that I look at every day with uh, great vigilance. And before you go a little bit further, can you, I think this is a good point to reference the, the lanes that we've added from a DOT pricing standpoint and, and how markets such as LA affect the surrounding areas. Can you go in maybe for our users and explain, you know, how much of an effect LA can have or, or how you can draw conclusions from, let's say Phoenix, for example, or, um, areas closely surrounding LA. For sure, for sure. No, that's a good that's a good point to uh, cover. So now that we have lanes, like I showed you before, uh, you can now kind of dissect this number with a little bit more detail. Phoenix is a huge market for LA in terms of outbound, inbound. Uh, a lot of volume flows into Phoenix. So anytime that you see LA kind of move up. Phoenix is going to be related. I mean, the networks are going to move because capacity is going to flow into LA, then out to Phoenix. And then obviously if you can get a load out of Phoenix, <laughs> you're, you're probably going to go back or, or, you know, you're going to stay in that particular region because I don't think there's a lot of freight coming out of Phoenix in any direction. Right. <laughs> um, so they're all kind of interconnected. So when you're trying to track down opportunities in the spot market, for instance, like, you see LA as showing decreasing tender rejection uh, indices. Your next stop, let me, let me break this down and see what's kind of driving this number because buried within that movement, there's going to be other things that are, look like I said before, moving contrary to that. And that's where your biggest opportunities are going to be, especially if you're a freight bro broker. Uh, one of the things that I think is, is very interesting to note, and I'm going to back out of the lane a little bit here, what the tender rejection index is really telling you is carrier attitude. And what I mean by that is you're basically, the carrier is the one controlling that number. So when they're turning down a load, they're telling you one of two things. 
uh, your, your rate's too low, or we don't have anything to cover that, that freight. So if they're doing it at a higher rate, uh, they're basically telling you, we don't have, you know, like this, the, everything is not in place for us to move your freight. Now on the, con on the converse side of the outbound situation, there's an inbound relationship. And I'm gonna pull up that for uh, Los Angeles in comparison. So over the last couple of weeks, we've actually, and I'm gonna turn off the relative, I'm gonna make this an absolute so that it's a little bit more easy to uh, compare. So you see right here, now that we can compare these two numbers side by side on the same chart, and you see this relationship right here, these, these crossing patterns. So when people are turning down freight going into a market with more frequency than they're turning down freight coming out of a market, you, it appears to tell you that carriers believe that market is a head haul lane, which that means there's not as much freight coming out as there is going in. Um, does that make sense, Brad? Am I being clear enough there? Yeah, I think, I think it shows that at this, at this point, as we've seen throughout July, the tender reject index in LA decreased significantly, which would imply, you know, lower volumes to an extent um, is one, is one uh, way we can look at this. I think it definitely shows as we see, it took till the third week roughly. Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, roughly? it's about, it's about the it, mid middle of July. It took several weeks for the, the carrier sentiment to change and say, okay, there's not as much coming out of LA or the spot market is not as there's not as many opportunities there so i'm less likely to go in as i was you know a month ago or at least you know at the rate that i was being paid a month ago that maybe needs to change now so i think that's hopefully that adds a little more color to uh yeah i think that does so i pulled up another chart right next to it here and something interesting that i've noted and so this is the tender lead time index. For those of you that aren't familiar, this is basically measuring the amount of time between a load is tendered and the pickup request date. So if a shipper sends over a load on July 1st uh, for a pickup request date of July 3rd, that's a two day uh, tender lead time. Uh, tender lead time is actually a measure of shipper behavior versus the tender rejection uh, rate being one of carrier behavior. What I find interesting in this in these numbers is where the two kind of have similar information whenever you're looking at a market and, and behavior patterns uh, there's always information uh, inequity like somebody typically has more information than the other and most of the time the shipper is at the end of that uh, line of, of information uh, the carrier is probably the second to know the broker is typically the first to know uh, and something that this information really tells you is when these two have similar information. So you see here that carriers basically realize that there's not as much freight coming out of LA as, as I once had. And that starts to happen about right here, um, July 16th ish. And over here on the tender lead time, the shipper doesn't really figure that out until a week later. Um, so there's, there's opportunity to be had because they're, they're pumping loads out of their system with higher uh, tender lead times, making sure that their loads get covered. The carrier understands that, hey, we're not getting, we're, we're having a cooling off in the LA market. And now right here, uh, about July 23rd is when the, the shipper uh, finally figures it out. Um, yeah. And I think that can potentially lead to the reverse play of the spot market if you yeah. in favor of the shipper. Sure. So which is why we'll see lower tender lead times, I believe is the conclusion that we can draw because if you're if you have more options, you're more likely to survey some of those options just as you would as a carrier or broker when you see sure. these increased tender reject index, when you see the decreased tender lead time, that implies that there's a little little more action if you will, behind the scenes in terms sure. of uh, different options being um, looked at from a shipper standpoint. Absolutely. So let's, let's go to another big market, the Chicago market, before we kind of cool things off here a little bit after all this freight market analysis. <laughs> so the Chicago market, actually, I'm going to pull up the uh, OTRI USA 
good old fashioned outbound tender rejection index for the country. And so you're gonna see here, and I'm gonna delete this so we don't have anything distracting us. So we see after the June peak, outbound tender rejection indexes across the country are declining in general. Like we said before, it's pretty standard for this time of year. The big question is, will it continue? I think we concluded that we need to wait the next couple of weeks to see if that's actually gonna be the case. Well, it doesn't mean that the rest of the country overall is experiencing the same thing. Uh, so one of the things that I do on a daily basis is I check my big four markets, uh, LA, Chicago, Atlanta, and Dallas, and see if I can find any weird uh, movements. Just so happens when I found, when I picked up Chicago over the last couple of days, Chicago is moving contrary to the rest of the market. This indicates that there, this is a signal that there's a potential opportunity in the Chicago marketplace. Uh, so as the country is declining on average, Chicago is increasing. So there's something going on in Chicago in terms of capacity. This could be a signal that, you know, a lot of people may not realize this yet. Uh, this may be something that's just under the surface uh, that's ready to pop up. And here in the next couple of weeks, uh, anticipating standard market performance mm -hmm. as, uh, as, as August typically has this, uh, at least this slight increase um, in uh, freight market activity as, as people come back off vacations. Chicago may be one of those markets that I'm paying attention to, to make sure that okay. one, if I'm a shipper, I'm not gonna get beat up on the rates. If I'm a carrier, I'm making sure that I am managing my capacity appropriately, maybe positioning trucks in areas that I can take more advantage of potential rate inflations uh, in the spot market. Uh, two, I'm a broker, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> so, because I'm looking, I'm looking at both. Thing. Yeah, I'm looking at all of it because brokers are typically kind of the uh, the guys that make the market. They're sitting at the top with. Uh, with high levels of visibility on shipper and carrier side, because if you're a carrier, I think everybody knows as a carrier, yeah, the shippers are not gonna be totally honest with you about what they're doing. As a shipper, the carriers are not gonna be necessarily straightforward with you. I mean, that's just natural business practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you never wanna to reveal too much. I think if anybody sat on these earnings calls, they kind of know. Yeah. Uh, nobody's gonna give you too much information, especially if they don't have to. Mm -hmm. And the tender rejection index is kind of a little window into general market activity. So right now you're thinking and all the news and everything saying, okay, things are kind of slowing down. You know what? I know that. Um, but that doesn't mean everywhere slowing down. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a, I think this is a pretty unique situation where maybe I'm looking at Chicago for some potential opportunities. Yeah. And now you have the, you have the ability to go into Chicago and yeah. say, okay, what's Otri Chicago to Minneapolis doing? What's Chicago to Philly doing? So you can break down the actual market and see, you know, is, is everything in general driving that market? Are there a few lanes specifically that are driving those percentages? I think, Let's do that. Let's, let's figure out what's going on in Chicago and break it down a little bit further. So Chicago has some regional markets uh, that they service. They're kind of a mini hub in the area in terms of how they, oh, I need to put in my CHI MSP for Minneapolis. And I see, well, that's pretty, that's pretty well correlated. They're moving in, this, in a similar pattern. Let's look at a shoot, OTRI uh, CHI to Dallas. Dallas is a, is a tweener runs. This is a big lane. Um, you can see that it's actually more, it's, it's considered a better lane in general than um, Mark, uh, than Chicago typically has because mm -hmm. their tender rejection index level for this lane, you see it's pretty correlated, but it offer like it's more desirable to carry. Yeah, there's more volume coming out of there. That makes sense. And, and I think, lower. I think everybody kind of intuitively knows that Chicago, Dallas, Dallas, Chicago is a, is a pretty strong lane in, yeah. in the country. So it's interesting. It gives you kind of an idea about like actual demand uh, or carrier mentality into certain lanes. Uh, if I'm a shipper, I'm, I'm keeping that in mind in terms of uh, rating uh, power. <laughs> well, Throw up, can we get a northeast lane in there maybe yeah let's see what's going on columbus i think is a columbus, good uh good it's area. kind of a gateway to the northeast and uh, i know that the northeast is kind of unique in the way that you know it's it's like the corners of the country they don't really they don't really carries don't really like going into either yeah. side you know i feel i think more extreme yeah let's try uh let's try chicago to philly actually let's go a little bit further 
And you can see, actually, it's at, that's kind of interesting to me because this is a lane that kind of moves in and out of favor in the Chicago market, like right here. I think, and, and, and correct me if I'm off base here, but I'll going into the, yeah, <laughs> going, going into the Northeast is generally an area that you really don't go unless you have to, uh, or you have some sort of regionalized network set up there. That might be your whole game plan is to be up in the Northeast if you're a carrier. Uh, brokers obviously are probably struggling to get those loads covered going into the Northeast in general, but when capacity tightens, uh, it becomes less desirable, even more so. So it amplifies the, uh, the, uh, exact behavior. I think it's your, your typical, uh, population to production, um, imbalance, if you will, there's right. extreme levels of population compared exactly. to the production that's coming out of that, co that region of the country. So in this area here, uh, underneath uh, in this gap here, that means that capacity has probably softened a good bit. So now uh, the Philly market becomes a little bit more desirable because mm -hmm. carriers are starting to gobble up loads that they normally may think are kind of second, third tier. Yeah. And now you can see in Chicago, it's kind of come back in to, uh, you know, it's being, it's a little bit, uh, I, I would say less favorable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. More favorable actually. So, that's yeah. one of the powers, I guess, of the lane uh, analysis. Yeah, definitely. And it looks like it looks like most of those, other than Dallas, are driving that upward. That everything that, seems to be a going, diversion from the USA. Let's see if we can let's see if we can find one that's not. There we go, okay. Chicago to Atlanta. So that one's actually becoming more favorable. <laughs> yeah, uh, people are turning that one down with a little bit less frequency. Uh, indicating uh, more willingness for carriers to move into the Atlanta market from Chicago. So they're trying to reposition their trucks into the Southeast uh, for whatever reason, potentially. But I think it's interesting to kind of break down these lanes oh, and, and see what's happening in each market. And you get, um, I kind of want to throw up this one last uh, map before we kind of yeah. start yeah. shutting down a little bit. A little bit of time. For those of you that haven't been on these webinars in the past, I still encourage you to go back through uh, I also want to throw this one out there uh, as kind of like one of the primary things that I look for every day. Uh, I go through the outbound tender rejection index weekly change on the map. And what this does is it tells me which areas of the country are showing the biggest uh, delta uh, week over week in outbound tender rejection indices. So the darker the blue, that means they've had a more basis point change uh, week over week. So in the last seven days, so North Dakota, is experiencing a strong outbound tender rejection index weekly change. You see right here, it's at 9.69%, which is pretty strong, even though that is a low volume area. Uh, so those, those percentages may not be as, as significant as you might wonder, but also when you're looking at any of these uh, areas, you can kind of tell well, what's happening in Memphis, for instance. Now we can go and kind of scroll down through here. Uh, it's only 1.2% weekly change, pretty much flat. Mm -hmm. uh, not a lot, not a lot happening there, but it's going to, it's going to key you in on where to kind of start your, uh, your analysis for the day. Uh, I'm looking for markets like, like Erie, Pennsylvania, potentially that are showing 15% uh, jump or I'm sorry, eight per, or 6.31% jump and a weekly change. Mm -hmm. Um, then I'm going to go to my chart. I'm going to dig down into it. Now that I got some lanes to look at, I'm going to start pulling it apart and then I'm going to work uh, whichever angle I need to work, shipper, broker, carrier type deal. And obviously for uh, the higher levels, you can use this in terms of freight market analysis pretty, pretty easily. I think yeah, if I, you want to get a general picture. Yeah, I think it's good. To, this is your, your first look and then see, you know, hey, this region is acting a little differently from, from this heat map view. Let's compare it to the, you know, maybe the closest high volume market. And then let's con compare it to the U.S. overall and just get a couple different points of reference to see, you know, exactly what's happening and maybe why it's happening or, or what, which regions are affecting um, each other. For sure. So we looks like we've only got one question here. If we will have volume on origin destination pairs moving forward. And Zach, do you want to take that one and explain what's going on? So with that? we, as of in the 
in the near term, uh, right now in the next in the next month or so, we're not planning on having that in place yet. Uh, I'm not saying that that's not going to be available at some point in the future, uh, but we are working on getting a volume uh, measure into sonar in the next week or two. Hopefully, uh, we've talked about it the last couple of weeks. We did run into a little bit of difficulty uh, developing it. Uh, there was a we, we turned it into an index, and what that's going to do is kind of give you a, a relative uh, measure of how much volume is moving in particular markets. So February 1st has 10 loads in it uh, coming out of it, and February 2nd has 11 loads coming out of it. Uh, the, the volume index will show 110 or 110% of what it was on February 1st, and mm -hmm. the uh, that I think that is actually going to be kind of the reference day is February 1st. Yeah, and it'll be by, by region. By, by, by market. By market. Um, it'll be available by market. So that'll give you a good indication of how much volume is actually impacting uh, capacity in any given market. Yes. And I think that's all we have. So if you have any questions, hit your little drop down screen if you are a Sonar user and you can get with us via the email to contact us at sales at freightwaves.com or through the website at www.freightwaves.com front slash sonar. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. If not, we will see you next week for the weekly Wednesday webinar and look for this webinar to be posted on our site this later this afternoon um, to tomorrow morning. Thanks for joining us and we will see you next week.